Hi, I'm John with JetBridge. We're an international group of elite software developers. And if you're looking for offshore engineers that are just as talented and ambitious as those in Silicon Valley, check out jetbridge.com. I'm also here with my two technical co-founders, Adam and Misha. And today our guest is James O'Brien. James is a professor of computer science at UC Berkeley and chief advisor to Juice Labs, a startup we love. Professor O'Brien has worked with film and game companies on integrating advanced simulation physics into games and special effects. And in 2015, the Academy of Motion Picture Arts and Sciences recognized his work in destruction modeling. I love that, destruction modeling, with an Oscar for technical achievement. He received his doctorate from Georgia Tech, is a Sloan Fellow, an ACM Distinguished Scientist, and has been selected as one of Technology Review's TR-100. If you've ever watched action movies or played video games that are maybe a little violent, there's a good chance you're a beneficiary of his work. All right, James, thank you for being on the JetBridge podcast. Uh, my first question is, when I was a kid, I would spend summers building these like little scale models. And after weeks of work, I would stuff them with fireworks and blow the shit out of them. And my mother never understood. She's like, what? why did you put so much work into it if you're going to blow it up? Um, why did you decide to focus so much of your time and energy on the realistic animation of destruction? Was it something that was kind of uh, a childhood uh, thing you enjoyed like me? Or was there a higher intellectual purpose? Um, well, it's certainly fun to uh, create these effects of things blowing up. I mean, it's in some ways, it's very satisfying to to watch something that is intricate and has a lot of detail and then watch actually how it comes apart in a destructive way. Of course, as your mother pointed out, the problem with that is that um, when you blow actually blow something up physically, then, you know, it's gone. You've destroyed it. And, and certainly if you're trying to do effects, you, many effects in movies just simply aren't practical, you know, spaceships blowing up and so on. Um, from a technical point of view, the, the thing that excited me about doing the destruction effects is that if you look at the simulation messages that are typically used in, uh, well, for simulations, the messages that are used in computer graphics for rendering, they almost always work with fixed apologies and they don't change the mess structure. Um, but if you want to have something like tear or crack apart, then, you know, if you think about what cracking is, it's you have like a piece of glass, it's a solid material, and now you introduce all these boundaries and cracks into it. And modeling those requires changing the mesh. If you want them to look real, if you don't want to look like, if you want to look like Lego pieces coming apart, then you don't need to change the mesh. You can use the existing meshes, but that's not gonna be realistic. Um, so if you wanna change the mesh to dynamically figure out where the cracks are gonna go, change the mesh to accommodate those and allow them to propagate, it's kind of a chicken and egg problem. How do you remesh when you don't know where the cracks are? How do you know where the cracks are when you don't have the right mesh? Um, and so that's a hard technical problem. A lot of people at the time I started working on this back in you know, the late 90s, sort of, uh, you know, I had just talked about the problem sort of being interesting to people and they said, oh, this is going to be too hard. It's not going to work. It, it can't be done. You know, variations of that kind of naysaying. And I personally find that kind of negativity very challenging. Um, so I think that if you are able to, uh, you know, if you're able to find a problem that you're interested in, it's a hard problem as far as everyone else is concerned, but you think you have a good solution to it that to me sounds like the perfect place to be working because uh, hopefully you'll be able to do something that other people haven't been able to do. Uh, I really liked the, what we ended up doing in that project um, and the fact that it ended up getting used in films and stuff has been you know, very gratifying. But I think the most exciting part for me was like, maybe the first time when I actually got the code running on a real example and then watched a, you know, one of my test materials actually tear apart. Um, those, little, those little steps when you get the first thing working, they're pretty exciting. So the short answer is you'd like to blow shit up. Yeah, but I don't want to have to keep <laughs> buying new shit. How's that? <laughs> that leads me to my next question. Um, there's a lot of talk about deep fakes. Um, <clears throat> there's actually a, a startup out of Ukraine um, that has a deep fake app and their round is oversubscribed and investors are going crazy. But when I think about deep fakes, I, I think about a potential dystopian future, right? I mean, today, any developer can download a tool and create a deep fake video, but it's, it's not so believable, right? Um, how close are we for that type of video to be undistinguishable from the real thing by your average non-technical person? 
Like, when can I go to TikTok and be Barack Obama's face? All right. So I guess one place to start off with is the, uh, you know, the term deep fake is used to just today to use sort of generically mean anything that is using machine learning to create a fake or forged or artificial image or video. Um, there's actually a whole bunch of different techniques that are that have been developed. Some of them have been developed by, you know, start people, you know, trying to start a company and make something for people to use either for fun or, or maybe for other purposes. Um, a lot of the work also originally came out of uh, research labs at universities, some work here at Berkeley, a lot of great work at UW, University of Washington. Um, and the original purpose of all this was to create tools that could be used for generating productive content. Like if I'm making a movie, Star Wars movie, and Carrie Fisher unfortunately passed away a number of years ago, but I need to have Princess Leia, well, now I can use a technology like this to have one actor act out the role and now replace it with a uh, Carrie Fisher's face, and that seems like a productive, good use of the technology. Using it to, you know, besmirch a politician or attack someone you don't like, that I think we all agree is a pretty negative use. Um, and so that means we, as you point out, we want to be able to see if, you know, be able to detect the fakes, be able to see if they're, uh, you know, if what we're looking at is real or if it's a, a forgery someone's trying to trick us. And right now, it depends on the context of what's being shown, how well or how likely you are to be able to detect it. Like if you just have like a video like what we're kind of shooting right now where someone's just looking straight at the camera and staying relatively still, then I think right now you can produce things that most people and even a lot of experts won't be able to tell is fake or is modified. Um, if the video is something where people are moving around a lot, like two people wrestling together, or you have someone who uses a lot of gestures and puts their hand in front of their face a lot, those sorts of things are going to be opportunities where the algorithms can fail. The thing is that if someone's really trying to perpetrate a hoax, um, they're not going to uh, just take the output from the, the, the automated algorithms and use that directly. They'll then load that into After Effects or some other video editing software, and they'll fix all the little mistakes. And what's happening here is it used to be if you want to produce the video, the, the fake video, you had to be highly skilled to do the replacement. It was a very tedious, time-consuming effort. Now the machine learning is going to do most of the hard part, the part that a human would have found tedious and difficult. It's going to do that stuff automatically. And now the human just needs to come in and clean up the little errors, the little glitches where they're able to see that something went wrong. And so the real answer to your question is today, if someone wants to perpetrate a hoax, I don't think they, you know, I think there's a good chance they won't get caught. Um, at least not until the hoax has been out there circulating for a while. Eventually someone might develop a new algorithm that can detect that fake, or they might find the source material and say, oh, here's the original source material. So this other video is clearly a forgery. Um, that actually happened uh, back when Jim Carrey was running for election with some photographs. There were some fake photographs put out showing him uh, on a, at a political rally that he hadn't actually been to a Jane Fonda. And the way those were disproved is they actually had the original photographs of an historical archives. So these forgeries can eventually be discovered, but typically not before they've done harm. And if we rely just like on the idea that you're just going to look at a video and somehow be able to tell it's fake, that's not true. Even the experts can't do that. Um, and the experts, when they do do an analysis, they don't just look at the video, they'll, they'll load it up into a tool that lets them, you know, reveal things that aren't vi typically visible to, the, to the, just the naked eye, you know, do color mod you know, mod modify the color palette, um, adjust the histogram to try to bring out the types of errors that are in there. Um, we do have algorithms can detect them. But the problem with these algorithms is they're kind of in an arms race between the forgery and the detection. Right? So if I, if I build an algorithm today that you know, can, can create a deep fake and someone says, well, I don't like that. I'd like to be able to detect when this is happening. So they go and train an algorithm to a, a neural network or some other type of uh, algorithm to detect my forgeries. Well, now that I see what they've done, I can now improve my forgeries based on studying what they did. And now they can improve their detector based on what I did. And now you just get this arm race that goes on forever. So I think that the situation we're going to end up with is as we go forward, videos, imagery, even 3D videos, you know, you know, stuff that, you know, even media that we're not typically used to today, those are all going to be, um, there, there's going to be the potential for those to be created um, that are fake, that will dis display things that are trying to mislead or fool us, manipulate us in some way. And we're not going to be able to tell, even with great detection technology, we're not going to be able to tell at the time they're released that they're fake. What will happen is, They'll circulate, we'll see them, and then maybe three weeks or a month or two later, somebody will come out and say, oh, I finally proved this is fake. And of course, by that point, the election might have already happened. You might have already, you know, petitioned for someone to be fired. Whatever the, whatever the action you took based on that forgery will have already happened. 
And so I think the real thing that people need to do is not rely on someone to tell them the video is fake, but develop a really healthy sense of skepticism so that when they see something, they don't just say, oh, this tells me what I'd like to see. Like the politician I don't like, here they're doing something bad. Clearly they're awful and now I'm gonna get all upset about it and, and, and take some action. Be skeptical, think about what you're seeing and don't believe the stuff that's too good to be true because you know, we've actually done some studies that looked at how people respond to forged images or how they look at images they, they might consume on the internet and how they uh, determine whether or not to be suspicious that it might be fake. And the number one factor that we found was whether or not they agreed with the content. In other words, if I show you a video that someone you like and it's something and the video is negative, you will, you'll be suspicious. If I show you something you like, a, a person you like and the video is positive, you'll, you'll be accepting. And if I reverse everything, you'll be accepting the negative videos about people you don't like and, and, and skeptical of the positive videos about people you do like. In other words, we just believe what we want to see or we just uh, believe what we want to be true. And if we want to be able to deal with the future where we're going to have fake media all around us, there's really nothing to do about it. There's no way that we're going to put that genie back in the bottle. Um, the, way, the only way we can really as a society hope to deal with that in a productive way is for all of us to be skeptical about what we see, right? We know that fakes can be made. We know that they're getting easier to be made. And so that means when we see something, we shouldn't just accept it as, as truth, no matter how much our eyes want to believe it. Right. Well, that's like the news now, right? Yeah. You were... You won an Oscar, but you're not in the Hollywood industry per se. Uh, so maybe this isn't a fair question, but do you think we're that far off? How many years before, for example, we can have Humphrey Bogart, who's long dead, or Cary Grant star in a major Hollywood movie? I think if you wanted to do that today, you already could. And we have a lot of examples of, of you know, characters that are very heavily CG characters like, uh, um, well, Thanos in the, 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 Marvel, the Marvel franchise films, right? Thanos is a major character. There's a, you know, definitely a hero character, not in the sense of being a good guy, but a hero is, a, you know, you've got hero, what they're called hero shots, focused on, on the, the, the actor's face, or in this case, the CG character's face. And you know, it's based on a human actor who acted out the character, but then you know, obviously that face that's, of Thanos has been heavily modified. And, and we're all pretty much accepting of that as being, a, um, as being a major role in the film. You could have, you know, someone right now today could make a movie about Thanos' backstory or something where he is the main character throughout in nearly all the shots and, and, and that would be fine. You can look at many other movies where you have characters that, you know, like in the, uh, the Pirates uh, franchise, you know, the, I'm forgetting his name, the character that sort of has like an octopus face or the other people that are cursed to live with him, right? They all have a lot of CG on their face. So this stuff we can already do. Um, and we can make realistic shots of human look, more human looking characters, people that look just like me or you don't look particularly alien or special. We can do those shots um, today, but they're expensive. And so right now, I think the main thing that would sort of limit doing a feature film with where, where Bogart was a leading role would be that it would be very, it'd be very expensive to just throughout, you know, for the whole film, recreate that, that face throughout all the shots. It's getting cheaper to do that. And so if you modify your question, say how long till it's something inexpensive and maybe even going a step farther, how long until it's something that, you know, a, a student filmmaker could do in their garage um, or in their bedroom or, you know, wherever they're working on making their, their student film. Well, then the answer is uh, we're not quite there yet, but um, you know, if we look at about five years from now and say, what would, how would the technology have evolved? I think that's about the point where you'll start to see student work coming out of film schools or independent, you know, people working with very small budgets, producing uh, films, their, their, their work, their art, where they will be able to take the face of the actor that they use to film the shot and completely replace it with um, someone else or something else. Um, and the technology will be easy enough to use and cheap enough to use that it'll be available, as I said, even to students. Mm -hmm. Wow. So C Casablanca 2 uh, is on the way in six years. That's great. Um, there, 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 you, sorry, sorry. There, there is one thing I want to add to that, though. Um, one of the big issues will be getting the acting like Bogarts, right? You can have someone that looks like Bogart. And uh, you know that's great, but if you really want the compelling acting to come across mm -hmm. in the way that he, you know, he he was, you know, he's still famous today because of the, the the amazing skill that he brought to the roles that he portrayed, and so that you know creating that's going to be harder. 
um, I suspect and, and that we will start to see things that are going to be the, the acting equivalent of auto-tune. So, you know, today, a lot of singers, you know, they, they're amazing on stage and they, they we love their songs. But if you listen to the raw recording, you're like, wow, this is all out of tune. What is this? And then auto-tune fixes it. Um, or in the case of, you know, even a skilled singer can use auto-tune to, you know, pu pu you know pump it up a notch or something. Um, I think we'll start to see similar things being done with acting. So the, the speaking, the movement, these things will all start to be able to tweak them slightly so that they're more whatever we consider good. And so I think that's going to be very interesting also. Does that mean there's a um, cottage industry for recreating um, a deceased loved one or an ex? Uh, you know, maybe. I don't know how it is. Uh, have you watched the TV show Black Mirror? Mm -hmm. It's an, uh, I think it's on Netflix, uh, you know, Netflix series on Black Mirror. They, there's one episode where they actually, you know, focus on this issue and it's, it raises a lot of questions, uh, you know, so the answer to your question, do I think it will be eventually possible to at least recreate a lot of the, the like surface aspects, the superficial aspects of someone like, like, you know, if, if you, if you, if you, if your loved one passes away, you won't, I don't think you'll be able to have a deep, you know, conversation that you might've had before when they were live. But if you wanted to have the experience, maybe just having a, a like, you know, just having them around and talking to you know, in your environment and, you know, having a lighthearted conversation. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's something, you know, I think that will be something that's possible to fake in the future. Will, will people want it or not? I don't know the answer to that. Maybe it'll be very creepy and upsetting, or maybe it'll be something that's very comforting and reassuring. I really don't know. Right. right. I suspect it's the latter. And it's going to be a really interesting future, especially for software developers creating this stuff, which is a good segue into my next section, tips for young developers. What advice do you wish someone had given you when you were first starting out your career in computer science? Um, so, you know, I, I guess everybody, you know, the, the, I think the piece of advice that's good for everyone is always, you know, wherever your blind spot is, right? And in my case, when I was sort of, you know, starting off and I was actually still back in grad school, I really was focused on the technology, the, the you know, developing my programming skills, my math skills, you know, all the, all, the, all the stuff that would make me a good programmer, a good researcher, a good scientist. And in retrospect, I think that, um, well, that stuff's all very important, but, you know, the technical stuff's really, really very useful. And, you know, we all know when we go to, you know, if we go to go into a CS program, we know, know to focus on developing those skills. But the relationships you have are also really important. And I think that uh, building good relationships is, you know, one, it's a healthy way to live. But the other thing is when you actually go out, when you actually are starting your own company, you're trying to find great technical people to hire, or if you are looking for a really great opportunity, those networks are really how you end up finding the good opportunities. They're really important. Um, and, and that's because you know, part of the problem is if you're trying to hire a, a, you're trying to hire a superstar to, to lead your team, just looking on LinkedIn or looking at someone's resume doesn't really tell you what you need to know. The way you find that out typically ends up being you ask through your network to, you know, who is going to be a great person for this role, and that's how you discover people. And so those networks are helpful both when you're looking for people um, to bring into whatever activity you're trying to do, and also when you've got good skills and you want to be able to, you know, not just have an average job, but really get into a great position where you're able to really use your skills to do something great. Those personal networks really help, help with that. Yeah, thank you for that. I Something that Misha, Adam, and I uh, talk about and teach a lot to the software developers we mentor uh, is what we call soft skills. And I think part of our soft skills trainings don't talk about networking enough. For, so thank you for bringing that up. It, it gives me an idea. What, what do you look for when you're hiring a software engineer, either for one of your ventures or for your research lab? What are some green flags of positivity and some red flags that you've noticed historically? It's hard to say what the green flags are because the things you're looking at, I mean, as you know, when you're looking for someone to fill a role, you need, they really need to bring a lot of different, you know, they need to have strength in a lot of different aspects that come together to help them fill that role, right? A great programmer is wonderful, but, but maybe if it's a leadership role, then he or she also needs to be able to communicate well to their team. Um, you know, you, they're, they're, you know, they're a lot, it's not just one skill, right? You know, they all come together as far as, you know, so, so you need well-rounded people that have good skills that you need. So that, that's sort of the generic green flags. 
The red flag question, part of this question, I think is a little easier. And the, the, for me, the biggest red flag, the thing that says, I just don't want to work with this person. And you know, maybe they're, they're a nice person to hang out with, but I just don't want them involved in my professional activities is someone who's unwilling to admit when they um, are wrong and learn from that experience, right? And I've seen so many projects go sideways because maybe you have a really great person, like they're really technically very competent. They know exactly what they're doing. Everything, you know, it's, they're, they're just technically amazing. They're also maybe even they've got the soft skills. They know how to convince people of their ideas. They know how to lead a team and get people to rally behind them. They know how to explain their ideas to management. You know, so this is a great person. But if they can't admit, oh, wait, I was wrong about this. The actual right way to approach this or a better way to approach this is to go this direction, then all those positives become a negative, right? If you have someone who is just flat out going the wrong direction, but they're great at proving to everyone else that they're right um, and sort of convincing everyone to ignore other facts, right? That, turn, that, that inability to see when you're wrong and revise your view of the world, that turns all your strengths into a negative. Um, and so being willing to say, hey, you know, if you're in your meeting and someone points out something you didn't think of, instead of saying, oh, I'm gonna like pretend I knew that already and uh, you know, stick to what I said, you know, sort of just bulldoze ahead, that's terrible. When someone says, you know, when someone, one of the bright people you're working with says, hey, here's this new thing you didn't think of, and being able to say, wow, you're right. And that, cha that completely changes my perspective of things. And now this is the new plan. That, that's the sort of person that leads to success. You know, those are the companies that pivot and end up becoming unicorns and going public. Those are the teams that develop the product that really changes the way people use your, you know, use your platform or whatever. Those are the successful stories. And if you can't admit it, can't admit you're wrong, you can't revise, then eventually you're just going to pull everyone over a cliff with you. You know, I was almost scared to ask you this question because I know you got a PhD from Georgia Tech and now you, you teach computer science at UC Berkeley. Um, but one of the things that I love about being your friend is that you always come from a place of authenticity. So let me ask you, you know, in Eastern Europe, where we have a couple of offices at JetBridge, getting a computer science degree costs a nominal amount of money. Sometimes it's free. Obviously in the US it can cost uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars. Is the US education worth that amount of money? Huh. Well, yeah, that, that's a tricky question. Um, you know, we were having network problems this, earlier. Maybe I should say, oh, my network's not working and pretend I didn't hear the question. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, th I think it's a hard question to, to answer because I think there are a lot of schools in the world where you're going to get a great technical education. Um, you know, I, you know, I can't, you know, if you're asking at a particular school compared to Berkeley, I, I don't know because I'd have to know more about this school before I could really do a good comparison. Um, so as far as sort of the, you know, there are a lot of programs in the world, both in the US and outside um, that don't teach great technical skills that, you know, sort of just go through the efforts. And unfortunately, a lot of people come out of those programs not really knowing how to program. They, they basically cut and paste code. That's all they've learned. And I'm sure you've met people that, have, that you know, quote programmers who are in that category. And it's, it's very unfortunate that they spent their money on a program that didn't teach them what they need to learn. As, but among the programs that do teach what you need to learn, that actually teach you the technical skills, um, there's a lot. You know, there's a lot of differences in what you're trying to learn. Berkeley, Berkeley is kind of a cool place in the sense that it, it's not just you know, if you go to school there, you're not going to just learn the program. You can also take a take business classes, and so you can kind of pull a lot of stuff together and develop strengths. Like my own my own research in, involves you know a lot of uh, a lot of mechanics, a lot of physics, and a lot of computer science, and a lot of applied math. And so being at a university such as Georgia Tech, where those were all available to me, that was really helpful. Um, and it allowed me to go in this direction. So I, I do think there's value there. Um, there's also a lot of learning that happens outside the class. And so in any school, whether it's at, at Berkeley, Georgia Tech, or you know, a, a school anywhere in the world, one of the things that I look for is, is how accessible are the instructors, the professors, the people who are teaching the material, how easy it is for you to sit down with them and say, hey, could you explain this to me more clearly? Or I thought this was true, but it doesn't seem to be working. Help me clear up that mistake. Help me. And also, even when you are completely understanding everything and maybe you're the star student in the class, are they available to let you go beyond the class material? Like some of the best interactions I've had with students are students who've come to office hours, not because they're having a problem, but just because they kind of wanted to ask about stuff beyond what the class was. And they end up doing research projects that you know turn into published papers and 
They end up working at NASA and places like that where they, they really get to do very cool things. Um, and I'd like to think that the opportunities that they had because they came after class and because I was able to be available to them and work with them, I'd like to think that that really helps them in their careers. Um, I certainly think it's a very valuable thing and it, it is one of the differences between, um, I think, a good program and maybe a not so good program. Um, yeah. You know, that, that segues into our next section, um, which is a little bit more technical. Uh, and speaking of authenticity, I wouldn't have any if I asked technical questions. So uh, Misha, Misha is one of our co-founders. Misha, I know you had a couple of questions for James after looking at and reading some of his white papers and research. Yeah, so you had an earlier paper where you looked at uh, simulating cracking on surfaces. So like paint on ceramics, glass, dry mud. And then I saw that later you, you worked on another paper with Pixar and Norway's Stott Oil, where you used uh, the same kind of research you did, but in modeling seismic faults in geological formations and reservoirs. What was the like process or the sequence of events uh, that went from this seemingly unrelated domain on the surface uh, to something uh, you know, a totally different domain. And is that something common in your research? Yeah, I think it is common. Um, so, you know, all of us when we're, when we're, you know, anyone who's working in a technical field will, will start to develop a certain tool set of things they know how to do. You know, if you want to use the analogy that you have a hammer and, you know, the old expression is when you have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. um, and that's sort of true, right? So from my perspective, in, in terms of doing fracture, you know, simulations of fracture propagation. If I'm doing it because I want to model what happens when a, you know, Godzilla sits on a fictional building, or if I want to model how um, some materials deep in the earth, no, not, not so deep, actually, it's fairly shallow, but, you know, how some materials in the earth um, are subject to stress and, and form a network of cracks, they're essentially the same problem from a technical point of view. Um, you know, some of my work was even used, uh, did a collaboration with a company that uh, was flash freezing strawberries. And they wanted to, uh, you know, study how airflow in their coolers, would, their blast coolers would work. Um, and that's just another fluid simulation. So when you have these tools, especially if you get to a point, if you ever get to a point where you're lucky enough to sort of uh, have an exceptional set of skills or you're really good at one particular thing, then start looking at what those skills can be applied to outside the area where you developed it. So with the geological stuff, um, I met um, Paul Gillespie, he's a, um, a geologist who studies these crack formations. He knows about them, he knows what's relevant and what, uh, re what's important about them, right? If you ask me what's important with, with geologist Paul Gillespie, and he knows about the, the context of these, these crack formations and, and how, what's relevant to, to the problems of flow through the crack formations, what's important about those, that's, you know, that's in his domain as a geologist. From my perspective, it's another fracture simulation. And so through our collaboration, we were able to look at a problem. You know, he's not an expert on simulating cracks. I am. By putting those two, ex those two sets of expertise together, we were able to attack a problem that we wouldn't have been able to work on separately. The same thing with the, the, the frozen strawberries, right? You know, I don't, you know, I never would have thought of the problem of how important airflow around strawberries is to blast freezing them. Um, but you know, I met someone who was working in that area, they had a problem and I was able to apply the skills that I had to it. Um, and I think that's, that's in general, you know, collaborations, you know, that's another, another thing to, to sort of a lesson learned that's very important. Collaborating with others, you know, I mentioned how developing those relationships with people is important. Collaborations, I think is also another part of it. Um, so it's a lot of serendipity then. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of serendipity there, but, but also, I guess, from my perspective, a lot of things that, that seem disconnected maybe to someone else's perspective, to me, are very similar, right? Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I've done work on, uh, for example, taking laser scans and using them to reconstruct 3D meshes. So, you know, and somebody might look at that work and say, wow, what does this have to do with physics simulation, you know, fracture propagation? Well, to solve the fracture propagation, problem. We have to you know, learn about remeshing and working with meshes and building meshes. And it turns out if you have a bunch of, uh, you know, laser points there from a laser scan and you want to reconstruct a surface for that, a clean, smooth, watertight surface that you could, for example, send into a 3D printer or use in a simulation, well, all those remeshing techniques now become relevant to that problem. So a lot of problems that seem from like an outside perspective or from a uh, perspective of what the context is or what problem they're solving, what their domain is, seem really separate or different, 
the underlying technical problem might really be the same. Mm -hmm. Sure. Now, I know that particularly in computer science, there can be a large gulf between uh, what's being done in academia and what's happening in industry. And what I'm wondering is from where you're sitting, do you see anything that's exciting that could be, you know, uh, really influence the way we live, changing society perhaps, that's happening, being researched right now, but hasn't made it into the mainstream or to consumers so far? Yeah, that's interesting. Um, so I think, the, I think the connection between uh, academia and industry depends on fields. And even within the field of computer science, it depends on subfields or areas. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you look at, for example, computer graphics, computer graphics uh, historically had, you know, it went through a period early on where it was all in academia, like computer graphics, you know, this is like before Tron, before um, the Star Trek uh, Wrath of Khan that used, you know, both were some early users of some uh, graphics effects. So before that, graphics was just this cool thing people were doing in labs, making pictures, and it was kind of esoteric. Um, at some point, um, we transitioned, you know, maybe in like, you know, the late 90s or something, we started to transition to where we are now, where graphics is heavily used in industry, and you know it's pretty much ubiquitous in film, for example, and you know it's all over video game. It's it's everywhere. Um, and if you look at the field, it's the area. It's changed over time. So today, I think the separation between academia and industry and graphics is very small. Um, a lot of the great work that gets published is actually actually done in in collaboration with with industry. So, for example, you know. One of my students, we have a paper, um, this is uh, Stephen Bailey's work. He has a paper on um, uh, animating faces using machine learning um, and that project, and that's gonna be in SIGGRAPH this summer. Um, and that project was done in collaboration with researchers at, um, at DreamWorks. And you know, it was built, it was actually built um, using their proprietary animation system. And it was built to, to help them on their next film basically, right? So there, there, there's no separation. It's actually um, right in there. So Paul DiLorenzo is the, the person over at DreamWorks who was collaborating with us. Um, and Dalton Omens is the other student that was, of mine that was also working on the project. Um, so Paul is, is probably right now working on getting that integrated into DreamWorks pipeline. And that's now, so the separation is basically zero. Um, you have other fields uh, such as machine learning, um, where you see that what's happening in machine learning is there, uh, there, not only is there very little separation between academia and industry, but I won't say that they're, they've kind of become the same. Like if you look at all the top places, like, you know, like you go look at open AI and say, well, who's over there working? It's a bunch of faculty who have taken leave or taken, or they're, they're, they're spending their time in both in the university and at the, uh, you know, and at these various industrial locations. So, so there can be a lot of a lot of connection there, right? You know, and then you have other fields. I, th I think um, I don't want to pick on any particular field, but there are other fields where um, maybe something like I, I think maybe uh, I'm going to use the example. I'm going I'm to go ahead and mention programming languages. Um, I, I think I was that, about to say that yes, yeah. Um, and I, I don't want to sound like I'm picking on that field. It's actually a great and important field. But when you think about like most people who are writing code, they, they use whatever language is available, right? They might prefer a better language. They might have a preference on which language they use, but ultimately they're gonna use whatever language is available, whichever one has the right library supported, whatever one is being used at the company they work at, you know, they're gonna do what they can. What's, and so it seems like there's a big divide between like the, the, the academic programming languages work and the in practice what people actually do. But if you look at like a like if you look at C and look at the newer features that have come into the latest version and stuff, and then you go back, you know, several years ago, you see those ideas popping up in academia. Hmm. And then they, you know, slowly migrate and find their way into, into practice. And in the case of a programming language, that's necessarily going to be slow because it um it takes time to, you know, take an idea. So if you're looking at the transition, for example, from you know, a very theoretical idea about you know, some new language feature to when it's gonna show up in an actual language that's widely used and you know, you know, like C++, for example, or Python that's being used in a lot of contexts, it's, it's gonna necessarily be slow, right? Because you have to figure out what the feature is, what the new idea is. Then you have to figure out how to integrate it either into an existing language or build a new language. And then once that's done, you have to push it out there and, and, and actually make a commercial, uh, you know, an industrial strength compiler that's able to, you know, actually implement the feature in a way that people can depend on. 
And then you've got to convince people to actually start using that. And so there's going to be a long delay. And I don't think that's necessarily like a fault of the people working in academia for like, you know, looking too esoteric a problem or not caring about getting out into the world. It's just that's going to be a process that has to develop. Whereas other fields, you can come up with an idea and just immediately hand it to someone. Like, you know, if I have a new way of doing a cool lighting effect in film, I can just go ahead and hand the code off to somebody at, you know, at ILM or Pixar and they could use it tomorrow. So, so different fields are going to have different speeds at which stuff transitions. Gotcha. Yeah. So tell me, why are humans so bad at shadows? Why are intuitions so wrong when it comes to evaluating shadows? Um, well, that's a great question. I think that our, I think in general, our intuition about isn't just wrong about shadows. It's, it's really when we look at images in general, um, there are a lot of things that are, could be wrong about the images that we're just visually not going to, our visual system just doesn't pick up on. And, uh, you know, that's one of the ways in which, you know, a lot of the tricks when people edit images and, you know, take things out of the background or something, this is, that's one of the way, one of the things they rely on. The fact that while we're very good at understanding the content of an image, we're not very good at finding problems with it. Um, and this is kind of, and this observation kind of is, is the reverse of what a, lot, what a lot of computer vision researchers would say. So computer vision researchers trying to write software that will understand the content of an image. And most of those researchers would very happily tell you how amazing our visual system is that we can look at, you know, a couple pixels and say, that's my friend, Bob. And, oh, he's got a new set of glasses or a new haircut. You're know, like, how did you figure that out from, you know, you know, 16 by 16 pixels? How did you get that? Our visual system is really good at doing those sorts of things. And I think what's one of the things that's happening, the reason why we're good at some of those things, like the understanding content, but we're not good at finding the problems is there's really no reason for in nature for us to evolve that ability, right? If you think about us living out in the real world, all the input is valid. It's like having a function in your code somewhere where you know the, call, the, the, the caller to your function is only going to pass legit arguments. Why should you have error checking in that function? It's just going to slow it down when you know for a fact it's always going to be called legit input. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're being called by something that you don't know what it is that's untrusted, you would check the input to make sure it's valid before you process it. Um, our vi you know, there was no reason for our visual system, you know, if we go out in the world, everything we see is a valid input. So we're good at understanding what's there. We're good at, you know, finding little things like, you know, a tiger hiding in the bushes or whatever. We're good at seeing things. We're good at understanding what we're looking at, but there's no real reason why we should be good at detecting fakeness because it just doesn't happen in the real world. So why would we evolve that capability? And I like to think of it this way, as you think about our visual system, whatever the input is, we project it into the space of valid things and then we interpret it. It's sort of like, you know, I mean, maybe this is too nerdy of an example, but it's like if you wrote some code that expects an unsigned integer to be passed in, and now some, some bonehead passes in a, a, a signed integer with a negative value. Well, your code's gonna interpret it as a, as a positive unsigned integer and you know, that's gonna cause some weird weirdness down the line and what, what, what output it produces. Um, and I think our visual system in a lot of ways is kind of like that. It wasn't designed to take these weird images and stuff that we're able to produce with Photoshop or RenderMan or whatever your software is. Um, it wasn't designed for that. Um, and so the result is there are a lot of things that can fool us into thinking things are real that aren't real or, you know, that's just the way our visual system works. And in some ways it's cool because it allows for all sorts of artistic illusions and cool, you know, a lot of great art, you know, one of the things that makes it interesting to look at is that it tweaks weirdness in our visual system of how we interpret images. Um, but it can also then be used by people who want to trick us into seeing something that's not there. So I could turn the shadow quality down on my video game and probably be okay. Well, in some ways, like if you, if the shadows go the wrong direction, you won't notice. If the shadows though are um, doing something weird as they move across surfaces, then, then, you know, so some things you'll notice and some things you won't, and it's not always clear, you know, the things you notice aren't always the, the, the things that are harder to do or easier to do. It really depends on what you're looking at. It's, uh, I think about an image, for example, like um, if, if I, you, right now we're looking at video feeds to, that's how we're all talking to each other because we're all different parts of the world right now. So we have these images, and when the images get um, our lower resolution, they can start to look blocky, um, pixelated. But we know that if you take a pixelated image and you send it through a filter that, clean, that takes out the pixelization and smooths it out, there's no extra information there, but suddenly it looks better to us, right? What we can, you know, the way we perceive artifacts and images and, and, and just in general, the way we look at the world, um, it's not really a mathematical analysis, right? You can have an image and say, this is a low res image, and the information in this image is exactly the same as this other image, 
but the fact that one looks blocky and pixelated and the other looks smooth to us is a huge difference, even though technically they're really the same image. Now let's talk about Berkeley real quick. So you've been in Berkeley a few decades. I grew up there. There used to be, well, there's still this main drag near campus called Telegraph Avenue. And I remember when I was a kid, there were a lot of gutter punks there. It was kind of a, you know, uh, hippies, kind of various lively shops, characters, uh, you know, campus free speech was still a big thing back then. Cody's books. We had Cody's, Cody's books. Yeah. Yeah. Now I feel like it's been recently more cleaned up and commercialized and kind of some of the soul that was there, some of the, you know, maybe grimy, but still soulful and interesting environment there is kind of dried up a little. Um, do you have any perspective on that or any experiences? On. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, I've, so I've been I've been been at Berkeley for. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. On just Berkeley or the wider kind of sphere around. Yeah. So so I've been here for twenty. I've been at Cal for twenty years, um, and that's when I moved to Berkeley, um, to the Bay Area, to the San Francisco Bay Area. And um, I mean, I think you. Ha I think I think you're right. Your I think your observation. I think it's it, you, you. You've noticed something that that's definitely true, which is that. As time's gone on, I think the San Francisco barrier has evolved into more into more of a kind of tech dominated monoculture. Um, you know, technology is this huge place of, uh, of, the, of the culture here to the point where like, if you, you know, if you just meet someone on the street um, there, and, and you, 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 you know, there's a good con and you go you know, meet, meet a new person on the street that you've never met before. They're a totally random person in the city and you decide, hey, this person's cool. Let's just go for coffee and talk there's a good chance that you're gonna end up talking about uh, something related to tech. There's actually a good chance that they work at Facebook or you know, some other tech company. Um, and I think that, you know, I think in some ways that's great because it's kind of nice to be able to, to, to share that common, common uh, experience of programming and technology with a lot of people around you. Um, it's also maybe unfortunate because uh, it, as you observed, it kind of pushes out other things. Um, and then, and then when we talk about the housing, you know, San Francisco housing is very expensive. We talk about those problems. A lot of those stem from really the way the area has evolved. It really, you know, lots of people crowding into a very small area focused on one particular industry. Uh, and some of the negatives of that are that if you want to do something else here, then it, maybe it's not very easy. Um, and also, if you're trying to develop a tech, if you're trying to build a tech startup, for example, or you're trying to hire people in tech, and you're not in you know a few you know in Silicon Valley or a few other areas where the, where there are sort of hot spots, um, it's hard to find good people. Um, you know, I was dealing with a company that's actually located in Connecticut a little while ago, and one of their biggest problems was finding people with the right level of skill they need that would be willing to move to Connecticut to work there. Um, so this this is real difficulty. It, it does create an opportunity, I guess, for people that are if you uh, if you're if you're a programmer and you've got some skills and you're willing to go to Connecticut, for example, you'd have some great opportunities that. Um, are there because of your willingness to relocate. I think that the, you know, with this whole COVID pandemic situation, a lot of stuff's moved to being working online. Um, and some companies really seem to be embracing it. Others are already saying this is bad and we want to go back to the way it was. A lot of workers love it. A lot of, and some people are complaining and saying they don't like the isolation. So um, I think it's going to be very interesting to see how this evolves over the next few years. You know, when, when hopefully this pandemic situation will be resolved quickly and we can all have the opportunity to go back to normal life. But one of the questions will be, are any of the things that we learned during this pandemic, are they, are they, maybe we wanna keep them when we go back. So maybe remote, remote working is something that is beneficial and we can keep and that would help in a lot of ways, or maybe we'll decide we didn't like it and as a side, we'll go back to the way things were. Um, who knows? It's interesting, we did an internal poll at JetBridge and 60% of our developers said they want to work outside the office permanently. Um, personally, I miss our offices. Um, I, I hope we go back to uh, being together physically. Adam is our CTO and Adam, you have our three last questions. Uh, yeah, hey, so I read your paper about multi-layer display and it got me thinking a little bit about how augmented reality displays will look like and when they will be a commodity heads up displays that you could use, I don't know, driving the car or driving a motorcycle. So when would there be heads up displays that would, that would be like, well, I mean, some, 
you mean like a heads-up display that's integrated into the car or like maybe like a, a, a comfortable pair of AR glasses you could wear while even while you were driving or? Uh, more of like an AR glasses, something that is small and portable. Like the heads-up displays are already in cars, but something that you could right. use that gives you that depth perception that this multi-layer displays gives you. Yeah, so I, I guess that's something a lot of, uh, so th this issue about having um, having a three-dimensional world that you see. So we, we're all familiar with, with static images or, or even moving images, but they're flat on our screens. And when we put on a set of a VR headset or an AR headset, we can now see in stereo, right? We see right eye and left eye images, and that gives us this 3D perception. I think what many people um, aren't familiar with is that in addition to having two eyes that tell us about depth because of the, you know, the stereo difference, we also, our eye focuses, right? You know, just like a camera and, and we're all familiar with this, right? If you need glasses like I'm wearing right now, or, you know, if I'm looking at someone close, the background's going to be blurry. Or if you take a photograph, we, we know about depth of field and things being blurry. It turns out that our eyes use the focus information to figure out as one of the ways in which they figure out how, how far away things are. And so, for example, if you look at, um, there's actually a feedback between the mechanism that focuses our eye and the mechanism that causes our eyes to verge, which is when you, the two eyes focus on the same thing, right? You've got two eyes and they both look at something. And those work together. And so the result is that, you know, when we're out in the real world, if we look at something, our eyes can very quickly lock onto that object and see where it is. And we have a good feeling for how far away it is because of the stereo and the, and the, the focal cues working together. Now, when we put on a VR headset, that's not the case. We have two eyes, but everything's being presented at one depth, the depth of the, the, the screens, the optical depth of the screen for the right and left eye. And what that does is if you actually are displaying things at different depths, it actually creates fatigue because your eye is trying to do what it normally does in the real world. So it'll see something like from stereo, from the virgins, it'll say, oh, this is 10 feet away, but the virtual screen in the, in the HMD is always maybe four feet away. And so it'll try to focus to 10 and then come back to four. And it'll keep doing that over and over again. And that's, if you, if you remember in the old days when 3D movies first came out, people would talk about fatigue and headaches and stuff. That was because people didn't know back then. And so they would display that they would use all kinds of different depths to put things. And the screen was always the same distance away where the, you know, 30 feet away, whatever the movie screen was, or if you watched it on your TV, whatever that distance is. And that was fatiguing because of this, this focal fighting that we would be doing, or our visual system would be doing. Today, what a lot of, in, in movies, what they do is they know about this problem. And so what they'll do is whatever the thing that they think you're, the director or the, the person who's putting together the film, whatever it is they think you're going to be focusing on, that will always be put at the depth that equals zero disparity. So we're, in other words, where the two agree. So if you're looking at the main character, talk, if you're seeing where the main character's talking, then the main character will be placed at zero disparity so that their distance matches the distance of the screen. And so now since you're focused on them, you're not going to get that, those headaches and that fatigue. Um, but if you, so in the movies, the content, the, the key content that they expect you to focus on is always put at zero disparity where the screen distance and the, the focus distance agree. But if you, maybe if you're watching the movie for the third time and you're looking at other parts of the film or you just happen to, you know, maybe you're obsessed with a certain actor. So you watch the film, you only pay attention to that person, not what they thought you were going to be those fatigue effects would probably creep back in because now you're looking at areas that are not at zero disparity and you're, you're focusing on them a lot. Inside an HMD, you're looking around, you know, head-mounted display, you're looking around the, the world and the virtual display is always at the same depth. And if you really want to create the, 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 the true feeling that you're in a 3D world, not just a fake artificial 3D world, you also, you need to get a lot of other things right, but one of them is that you need to get the focus cues right. And it's a little hard to appreciate because most people don't ex have, can't experience it. But in, in the lab at campus, on campus at Berkeley, um, it's actually an optometry lab. Um, Marty Banks is another professor there that I've collaborated with. Inside his lab, he's built this um, display device that um, allows you to actually display with multiple, um, multiple focal depths. And the experience of using that device is as big a difference in terms of how realistic things look and how real it feels as going from like a single movie file, like a single movie image to going to stereo movie images. Um, it's as big a difference in, in, in how, how it feels when you look at it. And uh -huh. I'm pretty sure I cut out again. Uh, no, we can hear you still. <laughs> okay. Um, 
And so if you, one, of, one of the things that's actually cool is that they're, they already are, you know, people are already working on trying to build, build displays that have this. The, uh, the Magic Leap actually has two focal planes. So when we talk about the idea of having different focal depths, I think most people, that's going to sound unfamiliar to most people. And, and maybe, you know, people, someone might not say, why is that important? If you think about the difference between going from a regular movie to a 3D movie, or between looking at a regular computer monitor versus putting on a stereo head-mounted display, that extra feeling you get of suddenly seeing the depth, imagine that big a difference, but now getting this extra effect with the, uh, with the uh, focus cues. It's, uh, really, it's, it's hard to describe until you actually try it and you suddenly realize, wow, that's what it should look like. Um, and there are displays out in the real world that, that, are, that at least try to go in this direction. So the Magic Leap head, uh, headset um, actually has two focal planes. And I believe originally their plan was to have more than two for exactly the reason that it creates this, this feeling of immersion and, and, and reality of, of the depth of what you're looking at. Um, but it's also difficult to build a display device, at least currently, with multiple focal planes. I think it's a question of time before someone figures out a way to, to actually do it, make it work, and make it small enough to go into like, you know, a headset or even better yet, into something the size of a pair of glasses that you might wear comfortably every day. Um, I, I think that's just a question of time before it happens. And, and I think that uh, that's gonna push the level of realism we get with our displays, um, you know, another notch beyond what we, call, what we currently call 3D or stereoscopic views. Yeah. Uh, I have another question. As I'm a gamer, I a little bit I'm a little bit not happy that the quality of animations in the videos is much much better than in computer games, as they have to be like real time. And there's it's really visible that in the video in the movies they are like more real. Uh, when do you think that the, this gap will be smaller, and can the Edge GPU help to close that gap sooner? Yeah, so that's a good question. Um, so right now, the main difference between, I mean, there are two things that cause the differences between uh, real-time graphics and offline graphics, right? Between games and movies, basically. Um, the real-time stuff obviously has to run in real time. So it has to, like, what, whatever your computing power is available to, that's the limit. Um, whereas in offline graphics, you can use as much computer as you want and take as long as you want. The other, the other thing that causes a difference in quality or is that with the online stuff, it gets generated and you're done, right? It gets, you know, it's 60, it gets rendered and 60, 60th of a second later, it's on your screen and that's the, and then the next picture comes. With a film, each frame can be looked at by an animator and say, oh, we lost the audio again. With a film, what is, bug here <clears throat> the, the, the one about sorry we lost you we lost right. you yeah sorry about that where did, where did it happen and i don't have a time limit so if you need to go a little longer to uh, i'm fine with that uh you're you... saying that the you know, film animator can take in something okay right so so in it, you know, so if, you, if you're doing stuff offline, you can always have an artist or an animator come back and you know, fix things up um, afterwards, right? So uh, if you don't like how something came out, you can redo it. If you, there's a small problem, you can touch it up. So that aspect of touch up and fixing things probably won't ever be part of the real-time experience for kind of an obvious reason that you can't put, shove an animator inside of your Xbox and, and trap them inside there. Um, but the compute aspects, I think, are going to equalize. Right. right now, we're getting to the point where uh, there's a lot of compute power, you know, even inside laptops, inside uh, relatively small devices, and that just keeps growing. The limiting factor in a lot of cases tends to be power, um, you know, battery consumption and heat um, tend to be the limiting cases and things like something you're wearing on your head. Um, weight also how, you know, you can build the device, but can you actually make it small and light enough to wear on your head? And so we're going to see what we are seeing already happening is a lot of techniques for taking the compute and moving them out of the device that you're wearing or the device that's in front of you and moving them out into the cloud where you can bring a lot more computing resources available. Um, so that, for example, as you're playing a game, just for the one hour that you're playing, you might be using three different machines to create your, create your experience. Um, and then when you're done, those go back into the cloud and somebody else uses them. 
the uh, one of the companies that I'm actually advising at uh, Juice Technologies is looking at a way of doing this specifically by taking the need to have a GPU in your machine and moving that GPU out into the cloud so that, for example, my laptop, you know, I've got, I've got a little MacBook Air, for example, the integrated GPU in that machine is pretty minimal. It's really not great for playing games. Um, if I wanted to, but, but, but the rest of the machine's fine. It's got memory, it's got a good CPU. You know, there's, no, there's nothing wrong with that machine. It just doesn't have the GPU to, to do my games. Um, if I'm able to take the GPU workload and move that out into the cloud and in a way that's seamless, completely transparent to the user, allow them to use their laptop or whatever device they have in front of them, use all the resources that is available on that machine and then pull in this extra resource of GPU compute, you know, maybe a $4,000 NVIDIA card that's sitting out in the cloud somewhere that uses up, you know, who knows how many watts of power and is just really puts out a lot of heat, something you could never put into a laptop today, but I can still access that and behave and, and my experience is as if it were inside my laptop. That's a pretty exciting experience. And I think that te techniques like that are going to start to close the gap between computationally what can be done in real time and what can be done offline. You'll still have the aspects of you know touch up and you know the human touch that won't that will be a difference, but the experience that you're going to start to see on um, in online games, um, it's just going to keep getting better. Um, and as the display technology gets better, we're eventually going to end up with hopefully situations where uh, the feeling of presence and immediacy are going to be very strong. And and maybe that's the solution to our you know we're talking about remote work and stuff. Maybe we'll get there eventually where the the remote experience becomes almost as good as the in-person experience. Oh. Yeah, looking forward to that. So we have a real life experience with friends. I have last question. Uh, what is the one truth that about the technology industry or about teaching technology in academia that most people don't uh, know or would, wouldn't disagree uh, with you on? This is, our, well, this is our Peter Thiel question. Shout out to the great Peter Thiel. Right, right. Um, hmm. Well, I mean, I mean, there are a lot of secrets from a technical point of view. For example, you know, uh, you know, I think as compute gets cheaper, that um, explicit or partially implicit uh, integration methods are going to outperform um, implicit ones, and I think most people would would find that a surprising statement. Um, but it's also probably not maybe globally very interesting. Um, the, the you know the, the thing I spoke about earlier um, in terms of you know, be willing to hear something that, that, that says you're wrong or just more generally hearing something you don't like to hear and being able to listen with an open mind and then integrate that into your worldview, accept that if you're wrong, if you don't think you're wrong and, and you, you still listen to but think you're correct, being able to articulate in a clear, without getting upset or, you know, creating a fight or something, be able to articulate why you disagree with, the, with whatever this new information was or why you think your view is still valid um, or still correct. Um, and being able to learn from the times when you make mistakes. I think those are all really important, but unfortunately I think that there's like this, uh, a lot of people have trouble hearing things they don't like. And so maybe it's not a secret. Um, I think most people at some level know it, but it's a secret in the sense that it's hard to put into practice. And I'm not claiming to be perfect at that, of course, but you know, both in terms of technology and also I think in terms of life in general, being able to hear things that you don't like, understand what's being said and think about them rationally I think a lot of, you know, technically, I think that's how you find solutions that you might not find otherwise. And as far as living your life goes, I think that's maybe a way to avoid conflict um, while still, you know, you can avoid conflict without being, you know, not being a pushover, not, you know, having, you know, having no say in the world, but you don't have to have conflict just for the sake of conflict. Thanks. James, thank you so much for spending an hour with us. I learned a lot uh, just by listening to the conversation. Um, we really appreciate it. Thank you, and I hope we can do this again. Well, thank you very much. It was, it was great being here. Good talking to all three of you. Um, hope we can do it again sometime. And I have to shamelessly plug, we have a YouTube channel. Our audio video tech is going to place it right here. Thank you, guys. Thanks. All right, cool. Thanks.